Thank you for joining this episode of our webinar series on best practices in e-discovery. Today's session is focused on mastering privilege protection in document intensive matters. My name is Jeff Fugit. I'm Chief Revenue Officer for Lexby, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our webinars. Our webinars take place monthly and cover a variety of relevant e-discovery topics, trends, best practices, and strategies. Space is limited to the capacity of our webinar platform, and with the popularity of these sessions, I recommend registering promptly for the sessions that are of interest to you. If you have technical issues or questions, please email webinars at lexby.com and we'll address them right away. Our webinars are available online at lexby.com for viewing via streaming video or downloadable as a PDF presentation or MP3 podcast. You'll find this webinar and a complete listing of other webinars at lexby.com. To be notified of future live and on-demand events, please email us at webinars at lexby.com or follow us on LinkedIn. Now a little bit about Lexby. We're based in Austin, Texas, and we provide a very affordable, high-performance, cloud-based e-discovery solution and services. We specialize in equipping the boutique firm with an e-discovery solution that gives them full control over the e-discovery process, DIY capabilities, and very fast performance. We're the industry's most affordable and full-featured DIY e-discovery platform. We're the industry's fastest e-discovery processing and document review platform. We deliver the industry's fastest return on investment per a study that was done by G2 Crowd. We have highly experienced e-discovery specialists and expert consultants who are all ACED certified. And if you'd like a demonstration of our platform, simply email us at sales at lexby.com and we'll get that scheduled for you. Joining us today is Gene Albert. Gene is the CEO of Lexby. He is a frequent speaker and author on e-discovery and legal tech topics. He is on the planning committee, Electronic Discovery Institute at the State Bar of Texas, and he is an e-discovery consultant and expert. Gene has a BA and MBA from the University of Texas and a JD from SMU. So this topic is fascinating, especially given the shifting ESI landscape and the proliferation of communication channels, as you can see on this slide, uh, from Slack, mobile messaging apps, as well as the growth in the number of email accounts per custodian. All of this exponentially increases the challenge of identifying and protecting privileged documents. Skype in particular has been a source of privilege disclosure in some very high profile matters. Uh, in addition, if you utilize an intelligent virtual assistant, you know, if you have any of those devices enabled in your environment, uh, like Amazon Alexa, Apple Siri, or Google Assistant, then you'll want to make sure you've got your bases covered when it comes to protecting privileged communications. Uh, luckily today, we've got Gene who will walk you through the best practices and critical steps to ensure you're protecting privileged documents. Uh, before I turn it over to Jean, I wanted to ask for your participation in some polling questions to help set the stage for today's presentation. And our first polling question is, what percentage of your matters do you consider document intensive? And while you're answering that, I'll take this time to thank you for participating in our polling questions today. All right, I'll go ahead and close that poll. And our next polling question is, have you ever had to utilize a clawback agreement due to inadvertent disclosure? All right, I'll go ahead and close that poll. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Gene Albert. Gene? Hi, I'm Gene Albert, CEO of Lexby. Thanks for joining us today for uh, the webinar Mastering, Mastering of Privilege Protection in Document Intensive Cases. A couple of comments I want to make before we get started. Uh, first, I um, can talk pretty fast. and We've got a lot of um, material to cover, so I apologize for that. And um, streaming video and, and uh, PDF of the deck will be available after shortly after the webinar for anybody who wants it. Uh, second, I use our own software, the Lexby Discovery Platform, as uh, illustrative examples, of course, for uh, functionality. But um, 
the similar functionality in large part is going to be available in other modern e-discovery uh, software programs. So the uh, and the, what I talk about is of general usage. Uh, third, is a short survey afterwards, and please stay around and complete it if you can. Uh, we review these very closely uh, to improve quality of our educational webinars and, and how I and others uh, do these. So uh, we, we'd love to hear what you have to think about what we've done, and, and you can also suggest other subjects or you'd like to see as well. Uh, for the agenda today, we're going to go over um, causes of uh, invertent waiver, uh, the uh, legal requirements under the federal rules, uh, optimized workflow and logging, and some particular issues that come up, uh, email threading, uh, near dupe analysis, uh, categorical logging, then we'll finish up with the tips and best practices. This uh, next slide just shows the uh, the amount of uh, data growth and what that means and uh, the impact it has on, on privilege claims. It, the, the data that's in a modern case just continues to grow uh, as we use use more and more um, uh, communication methods and it's amount of just the, the sheer mass of it uh, but also uh, the different types that, that are, are coming online so we're seeing more and more uh, uh, text messages and corporate IMs um, social media being being relevant in cases so that should be looked at as well and uh, gotten into a um, um, uh, a um, form that, that can be uh, readily searched and uh, coded. And um, obviously the, the, the data is going up, but the case budgets and timelines aren't. So there needs to be better and better technology to be able to uh, do this properly. What are the, the risk problems and privilege review? Um, well, first off, there's just, just more to review than there, than there used to be. Um, and then, then secondly, we, we use in the in modern cases, it's not practicable to have somebody put eyes on every document. So you have to rely on technology to, to review, usually search or, or uh, possibly TAR to identify documents that are potentially privileged. Um, third, um, often you, there could be reviewers that aren't familiar with the case. So that, that can be complications on making sure that, you know, that um, for coding in general and um, possibly uh, privilege and work product in particular. Also, there's many exact duplicates, but also near duplicates documents that aren't, don't quite get, get uh, are not close enough. They can, they can be caught up with a common hashing algorithm to be identified as an exact dupe. So those um, need to be identified and that can be a particular problem with uh, privilege control. And um, an another issue is, um, uh, handling uh, related emails, uh, threading, or, or just closely related emails. How, how, is, how is that done um, with a view to making sure that privileged documents aren't missed? I'll go over the, the uh, rules having to do with this um, and uh, the uh, ABA model rules of which uh, most states are, you know, rely on are, are not very detailed. Um, there's a 1.6 that uh, says you should reveal information uh, without consent uh, representation. And then uh, one, the A and then the C is that uh, the lawyer should take uh, reasonable precautions to prevent uh, unauthorized uh, or inadvertent disclosure. Then under the um, professional conduct rules, uh, 101 uh, requires a competent representation and also that the lawyer uh, keep abreast of the law, including uh, the benefits and risk of uh, relevant uh, technology. Uh, some states go further, in particular Florida has uh, requirements for COE on um, litigate, e discovery and other litigation technology. I'm not aware of any other states that have required that yet. The Sedona Conference, which is a thought leader um, of uh, mostly judges in this area, uh, says that uh, litigants should use appropriate search and retrieval methods uh, to uh, leverage processes and technology to include quality and efficiency. So uh, mom, mom and Apple stuff there. The federal requirements on, on the rules um, are the federal rule of evidence um, uh, says that an inadvertent waiver will not lead to a broad subject matter waiver. And uh, 502D uh, <clears throat> enables parties to establish a, a discovery protocol and also particularly um, refers to clawback agreements in the um, there and then the comments uh, 
And um, also, uh, um, this, this allows for categorical logging, uh, which we'll, um, we'll talk about later. These can, under 502D, this can be part of the party's agreement in an ESI order or other um, court scheduling documentations, or the court can also do this on, on its, uh, its own initiative. The uh, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure under uh, 26, where it's addressed, uh, interestingly, we really don't talk about privilege log uh, requirements in much detail. This has been left to case law or local rules, um, I'd say given the importance um, in, in cases. Uh, so this gives a very, uh, very, uh, very general description of what, uh, what needs to be in a log. But uh, in case law, the courts have required more specific logging. Here's a, an SEC case that I, th I think generally uh, addresses the, the state of the law now, which is um, uh, general nature of the document, the author, date written, information about the address, address C, um, anybody received copies, uh, the document's location, and the reason it's been withheld. The, the case law really hasn't been updated as far as I've seen very much to specifically get in, to get into some of the issues that are involved with uh, modern um, modern communicate email and other modern communication systems as to what information is, is reasonably available as part of that. One uh, that I found that's interesting was a, a recent uh, 2019 case where the judge in some BlackBerry litigation uh, approved a, a litigation privilege log uh, on review, this this wasn't a requirement that this would be in all cases, but just one that came before the judge or the judge approved. But it gives you an idea of some of the stuff that can be included in privilege logs, although I, I think this goes beyond what I've seen in other cases as being a requirement. But this one had a document control number, which is probably a base number, a document class or the type, type of document. Um, if it's in an email chain, uh, the doc, the date of the parent email, if it's part of a chain, the author, recipient, uh, uh, individuals copied or BCC'd, indication if anyone uh, who authored, sent, or received it was an attorney, uh, the general subject and a general description of the document, the privilege asserted. That that's a very comprehensive list, and you know I don't see that generally being done all those in all cases, but this sort of information is generally available in our and other e-discovery platforms. So this can be included in a uh, privilege log if um, that's what um, is needed in the case. Uh, the law on, on uh, privilege logs is, is uh, use it or lose it, that uh, if the danger of an, of an improper log or, or not supplying a log at all will be that this could uh, uh, result in waiver. Uh, there's um, arguments against that. Um, in the article I, I show, and, and, and courts are, of course, uh, disinclined to do that very quickly, but that, that's always a risk if the, the uh, privilege logging rules aren't um, followed adequately. There's special issues that come up with, with uh, privilege and privilege log. Corporate communications, um, who's, who's the client? There's, there's different rules in, in different states and different jurisdictions. Um, if uh, in-house counsel is giving legal or business advice, that, that comes up a lot in litigation. There's a joint defense common interest privilege uh, that's used in joint litigation, lots of rules around that. Uh, there's also a, a fraud exception uh, that shows where that was uh, litigated. Again, in a recent case in, in, in um, 2019, an issue that comes up is how to handle uh, emails and attachments as part of ours and, and other modern uh, e-discovery uh, platforms, the attachments will be separated from the uh, email body and, and, and separately processed, and then they'll be associated back in for review. They're actually carried to se separate documents. And the question is, what, what do you do if an email body is a privilege and the attachment isn't or vice versa? Um, there's there's several different ways of handling this. It is possible to uh, break the email families and separate the association from the email body from the attachment in our system and, and some other systems do allow that. But um, in my experience, that's usually not the best because that, that, that can cause review and production questions and, and platforms because the email body will show that there are attachments and then they don't all get, get produced and then questions arise about that. And not that that can't be handled or that's not the appropriate thing to do in a particular case or 
if that's the preference of the attorneys in the case, but it, it, it's not without its, its problems. It's, it's no panacea. Uh, sometimes if the attachments have been produced separately and somebody does a review and is comfortable with that, they're, 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 um, can be comfortable with withholding duplicates and a privilege log, even though they're technically not, um, I'm referring to attachments here, they're technically not not privileged if they've otherwise been been produced uh, just in the um, name of, 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 of efficiency of review. And uh, that can be a good solution. And if that's acceptable to the parties and, and judges may think that's just fine, even, even if one of the parties doesn't accept that. Uh, but that can be an issue to address. Uh, a, a good solution, mostly, is to take the is to is to produce or withhold the email families as a group. But if an email, um, but that it, it may be possible in many emails to go in there and create a redacted version of whatever was privileged in the email body or the attachments, and then go ahead and produce it as non-privileged at that point, and then create a separate log that's. Um, redacted uh, privilege information and log that in a similar fashion as one would would a privilege log, and then just go ahead and release it. And uh, that's usually satisfactory if if, it, if it's not too burdensome to do the redaction, and that makes sense when the privilege portions of the email family is is minor compared to the you know the overall uh, amount of the um, of the email family. All of this may be addressed uh, specifically in an ESI order or otherwise agreeing on this, but uh, these are some of the issues that can come up. Another issue is how to handle email strings. And here I'm referring to not separate emails that could be part of one overall conversation, but instead when somebody does reply or forward, forward where you can get often a, a very long string of different emails and forwarded emails, but they're all within one document. Theoretically, those could all be chopped up and made into separate documents, but uh, nobody ever does that since that would just be incredibly expensive and a very manual process to do that. So, um, and there's a question of how, how to deal with, with that. Um, <clears throat> there's um, some different rules on that or, or different approaches courts have taken on that to, uh, uh, to log it, but, but uh, one, one way to do that is, is to treat is to look at the overall conversation and when logging these email strings to have all the senders and all the receivers in the to and from and then the date range uh, handled for these. Um, and and that, that can be a way of handling that. Sometimes uh, what's logged is, is just the, the uppermost email or the last one and that, that's commonly done because that's the information that comes out of the system without some manual coding that goes in there. Another possibility is to uh, go in there and, and um, again, redact out whatever's privileged and then go ahead and go ahead and produce the redacted version of it, as I just mentioned. Uh, search is very important and the, the main way people find um, privilege logging. It, it is possible to use predictive coding for privilege logging, but it, it's not very specific. And, and I'm not sure that the law is really there that allows that without agreement that you could be withholding privileged information based on the um, uh, based on what a predictive coding algorithm or tar algorithm would find so um, there, there may be something out there I've just I've never seen it and I'm not sure what the basis for that would be there um, so, so normally either manual review or search is what's uh, used to find privileged information so that that's very important the quality of the search and the methodology that's used uh, Sedona conference again talks about that and says that um, there should be um, you should be able to substantiate the methodology. There should be quality control measures and it should be tested and verified through a sampling or other techniques. Here's an example of how that works in, in our system. You can use a simple or Boolean searches and um, there's different ways of doing it. There, there's only having a Google type search that, that's very simple to use. It has got a lot going for that. It's not uh, overly complicating things. A lot of other search options there can be, you can add in concept search or do we, uh, fuzzy or stemming, uh, which will give approximate uh, versions of it and um, and take it back to a, a root, root word for the searching with the stemming. Um, Boolean, you can do complex Boolean. Uh, and then it'll show keyword highlighting, you know, off of the search when you open up the document. 
uh, we do a couple things that not everybody does. We have something called an Uber index that I'll talk about a little bit later that that um, shows the, uh, uh, the that uh, adds in the native text extraction along with the paginated or, or imaged or OCR versions of it that can give a broader search results. Also, you can integrate in translations uh, that have been done into the into the record as well from a foreign language in, into English. Uh, this is again the this shows the document viewer in our system, and uh, here you've got different versions of the documents under different tabs. So you, you can look at the extracted text or the OCR version or the redacted version, um, et cetera. Uh, so that that can be helpful in doing doing one's privilege review. Uh, this this shows the um, privilege uh, workflow where, where you can go in there and, and do search results and then do an auto update. Uh, you know. Um, updating the number of documents here, 421 to responsive. That could have been uh, privileged as well. Any of the, the built-in or custom fields can be auto-updated like that and uh, be the same in other, system, other modern systems as well. Uh, another thing that's helpful in doing privilege review is that um, th when, when one's going through documents, looking at it, the, the propagate coding Field on the upper left codes the entire email family at one time, which um, usually is what people want to do, and then that can be done on a one at a time or on a um, on a, um, a mass basis uh, off of search results to speed review. The Uber index I referred to uh, was something that we have is that um, most search engines will will either index native extracted text. This would be things that parsers can pull out of a uh, word or, or, um, or, or sim, uh, Excels or similar documents. And that goes into a search index or they'll be, be imaging the documents first into a TIFF or uh, very common or sometimes other, other image uh, file formats, uh, JJP, PNG, and then running OCR on that. And then, um, doing the search off of that. Some systems will do both and have them in different indexes. So you have to go and do a separate search, search each time. What we do is, is we, um, we join those together in one index. So the search always gets both of those. I think it is a good idea to have a system where you can search to both because they'll bring back surprisingly different results. The uh, native extraction will, will will pick up a lot of things that, that an index, or I'm sorry, an image version will not, such as um, text that's hidden, hidden sheets, uh, print print selections, uh, comments in PowerPoint or documents, um, number of things that things are missed. But then the uh, native extraction will also make, uh, miss anything that would benefit for CR. So any any faxes, attachments that come in as images, embedded uh, images inside of Word documents, Excels, or PowerPoints, all that wouldn't be searchable in a system that uh, merely does text extraction and does get picked up with the image to OCR. So for us, the best answer is is to bring in both. And and this is important whenever when when one's doing a document review to make sure the search brings back the maximum number of documents that you, you think it is possible with the technology, but uh, is even more important with privilege review. Another issue is how to handle email threading. And this is, is taking associated emails um, out of an email chain and allowing a visual re uh, a representation of them together and coding together. Uh, we've uh, recently redu uh, released a visualization tool that you can see here where, where it shows the thread, which is built up based on metadata in the email uh, to associate it with other emails that are in the document collection. So you can you can um, click on one through the other and see how they're associated and uh, get the details of them and then and then show how how um, they went from one to the other. And then you can also jump into the individual email and go from one to the other in the document viewer as well. Uh, that interesting also also shows that there were some missing emails here that didn't get get collected for whatever reason. and that'll come up sometimes where the the uh, metadata in the last email will show, will refer to earlier emails that you might have in the collection, but not uh, not middle ones. And that can be sometimes um, 
interesting to see why why that was missed and you know if that was a what was a reason for the for a holes in a, in a production and we cover that in another webinar in more detail another great technology for email review i'm not sure and, and privilege review is is duplicate detection uh, exact dupes are identified in the system based on metadata off of emails and having exactly the same substantially the same metadata and also a hashing algorithm on native documents that allows you to identify the, the, the exactly the same document that's been produced multiple times including attachments um, but those will not be all versions of documents that appear to be identical or or are very similar. So an example of it is if you had a if you had a Word document in a in a collection and also a PDF version of that same Word document, though they're exactly the same documents by all appearances, they're very different to the computer and they would not come back on the same hashing algorithm. Also, there's a lot of um, you know certainly versions of documents that have minor differences between them, um, both emails but also um, versions of documents like a a merger agreement or something where there's many different mer versions of them and some some are are slightly different uh, a near dupe algorithm will bring those back together in one near dupe grouping another example would be a document is, is produced and then another version of its produced is, has handwriting on it that, that would not hash the same but once uh, ocr was done and the near duping uh, near dupe grouping algorithm was applied then those would come back as, as near dupe groups so this gives an example of how a, a near dupe group comes back where you can see similar emails here that even though they're, um, they're separate emails, there's enough similarity in text, um, which is uh, usually 50% um, of the text in general or, or greater puts it into an, a near, near dupe group. But the algorithm is more complex than that, but that's, that's generally what, what happens with that. It allows you to look at them all at the same time, review them and possibly code them all at the same time. This is particularly important having to do with privilege. What we'll see sometimes um, in the case law is, is that uh, sometimes reviewers have caught sometimes many versions of privileged documents, but some have, have slipped through the cracks uh, because of, of differences in, in reviewers or somebody just missed it. And it, it's kind of a shame that somebody was able to identify a privileged document in one case, but then wasn't able to, uh, you know, the system didn't pick pick them all up, and that that happens uh, more than one 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 might think, uh, you know, because it's just a matter of, of individuals looking at it and individuals uh, make make mistakes. The the near dupe grouping uh, technology can be really helpful here because you can go through your near dupe groups after you've done your privilege review and see if any near near dupe group groups um, have partially have showed some some privilege some not usually that means they ought to all have been privileged but but then that gives you the opportunity to go in and then review that in case as, as a QC function and we recommend that be be done uh, whenever possible in cases uh, and then this shows how it looks in the document viewer same thing that if you pull up a document you can see both exact dupes in the document viewer on the right and also the the, the near dupe groups you can look at those so when you're doing your privilege review at that point in the document reviewer you can also jump in and make sure the uh, all the exact groups and the near, near dupe groups are, are privileged uh, coded as well automatic privilege logging is is a key feature of modern e-discovery um, programs are ours and others what it does is it pulls the metadata out of the out of uh, particularly emails, but also other documents, and it, and it gets into the system, and this includes the, the normal um, elements of a privilege log, you know, including sender, receivers, uh, date, date, time, document type, et cetera, uh, and it will pull those, the subject line of the emails, uh, or at least the, the last uh, email, the top email in a document, and put that in into the into the privilege log so you get a, a, a first version of a privilege log that, that has all the information that's needed on that. More fields can be added as custom fields if uh, one, one wants, but uh, this very much cuts down on the amount of time that is needed to prepare a privilege log. And then when it's, it's all ready, then that can be exported as an Excel sheet as a privilege log. What one does with email uh, chain protocols, we talked about uh, a little bit earlier, is uh, there really aren't a lot of rules on on how how that's handled. Um, 
one place where they have done that in, is in New York, where they've got a specific rule on that. And it um, talks about what an email chain is. And then if uh, one is there, then it allows uh, of a reduced coding of it, of, of one, one entry for the entire chain. There's not any requirement of this in the federals anywhere. And I, I haven't seen it specifically required in any case law. So if this is being implemented outside of New York, it would generally be done as part of a 502 order. Um, this all may, there may, I think there's also local rules in, in different particular jurisdictions that go into this in more detail and might require something like this as well, but it's not, it's not a, a general agreement as to how this ought to be done. Another a great area if it can be done is uh, categorical designations. And uh, this idea has been down, around for a, a long time. Um, and uh, it was actually included in the uh, comments to the uh, Federal Rule Civil Procedure 26 back in 93. It says that document by document law may be uh, appropriate if only if it would be um, un unduly burdensome with high volume of documents, if they can be included in categories. Uh, this is uh, uh, particularly implemented in, in New York. Uh, and it's recommended by the Sedona Conference. Uh, in, in my experience, um, you know, it has to be, be be agreed to generally the parties, and it would uh, will be agreed to only when there's uh, synchronous requirements on privilege production by the parties. If if one doesn't have very many privilege documents and the other does, they you know generally won't agree to it. But uh, uh, it, it certainly can can be agreed to. Uh, by the parties, and it it's, uh, it's, can be uh, great for reducing the cost of privilege uh, log creation when that can be done. Um, How is this used? What will the, the, the categorical designations and are, are generally a date range, the document type, uh, the sender receivers who's been copied on it, a category description, a privilege justification, and the, and the total documents withheld. When is it used? Um, Sometimes uh, you know, the categories could be uh, communications with outside counsel regarding a matter, uh, communications uh, prepared in anticipation of litigation, work product communications, uh, uh, communications with inside uh, counsel uh, reflecting legal, legal advice in a matter, maybe other categories. This is what it looks like. This is um, from some documentation in, in New York where this is recommended, where you can see how this would, it would come out, where instead of having 415 documents uh, entered, uh, you know, it could be handled with, with uh, a single entry on, a, on a, a document or spreadsheet of 415 if this is agreed to, and this is how with the description would look like. Another issue to be uh, watch out for with uh, privilege is uh, re redaction issues. In, in general, of course, uh, set of information and, and possibly privileged information should be redacted prior to pr prior to production. Uh, issues can um, can be come up with that. Um, what, one is that you, you'll occasionally see somebody using a tool like Adobe Acrobat and in, and using the wrong portion of the tool. Uh, Adobe Acrobat, the the newer versions ha have a redaction tool that does it properly, but people sometimes will go in there and redact using uh, just the drawing tools, but that doesn't does not eradicate the underlying text layer. And then there's a lot of famous cases, uh, instances where this has come up where, where people will send something out that's redacted and the text text layer is there for anybody who searches it or knows how to look for it. So um, that's that's not the case in in our software with our redaction tool or or, or other other modern ones as well with most companies where uh, the, the uh, document is converted into an image, a TIFF or other image. We use a JPEG and then, uh, um, and then convert it back into a PDF or TIFF on the redacted version to make sure the underlying text layers are done away with after redaction. Uh, other issues are, are natives. Um, usually native uh, files are not being redacted directly. Um, there are, there is, um, are some tools on doing that for Excels. Um, for that as specialty tools, but um, nor normally the the natives are, are should be withheld as part of the re re uh, the redaction and and not been done directly. So if that's been done, then one needs to make sure that the natives are not being accidentally produced as part of a production. 
our uh, system and, and others have logic around that uh, to make sure that, that uh, the natives are, are withheld. There's a similar issue with container files. Um, if there's been any uh, redaction, then uh, a zip file or, or other things that are container archive files need to also be withheld or the privileged information go within that. Again, the uh, log of the e-discovery program will, will cover all that as part of a normal production workflow. On all of this, uh, one needs to build in time for uh, QC procedures uh, after the fact on that. Uh, and, and that can be done with um, running your privilege searches again uh, against the uh, your, your your documents uh, ready for production uh, with a uh, to make sure that that your privileged keywords aren't aren't coming up, but one needs to build in time and have that procedure. It's possible to put language around uh, what the privilege log and the privilege procedure is going to be in an e-discovery order or or other. Um, uh, case uh, scheduling agreements. Uh, we have some sample language in uh, uh, an ESI uh, order uh, that Lex Lexby recommends for that covers um, privilege logging, but, but also a, a number of other uh, e-discovery subjects that can come up in general and, and in Rule 26 um, meet and confer conferences. And this is available on our website for download or on request from any of our staff. Um, you can see it covering privileged information, the log, uh, and then also having having the clawback. Uh, we we recommend that the clawback be included in, in, in really in any case. It's hard to imagine when it wouldn't be a good idea to have a clawback agreement as part of um, your normal case documentation. Uh, last, I want to finish up with um, just a summary and some uh, checklist of recommendations. Uh, first, uh, you know, make use of Rule 26 and, and communications with uh, opposing counsel early in document efforts and, and have have any privilege issues and privilege log issues addressed there. Have a CLAW agreement. Uh, use a modern e-discovery platform uh, to make sure that you get the benefits of the technology and the logic and protections built in. Make use of categorical logging if it's inappropriate for your case and you can get agreement with opposing counsel. Uh, project manage your, your privilege review and build in time for having protocols and, and doing your, your QC review uh, before you make your production. Um, address redaction issues. Uh, make sure you, you address your, um, your, um, you're, you're not um, producing your natives when, when you're uh, doing redactions on, on PDFs or image versions. Uh, Consider using a redaction on, on privileged strings with handling of the attachment issues on that. Uh, use an ESI order if possible. It's a good way of uh, handling this stuff early in the case. And use uh, near dupe technology as a, as a safety valve for catching documents that otherwise might have eluded um, a human or other privilege review protocols. Well, that's going to end it for me on this. Uh, th thanks again for everybody's attention. Let us know what you think and um, send me any comments, and I'll turn things back over to Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. That was a fascinating presentation. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Lexby and the Lexby solution. Uh, Lexby is uniquely positioned to really help boutique law firms and organizations that want to keep e-discovery in-house solve for those challenges of large and growing data sets we equip boutique firms with the most efficient infrastructure, expertise, and advanced capabilities to make sure that you protect those privileged documents. So Lexby really facilitates the mantra of lean and mean for the boutique firm with on-demand cloud-based e-discovery capabilities. You not only have leading edge technology and performance and security, but it's a fraction of the cost of dedicated on-site infrastructure of big law. Uh, Lexby auto scales to ensure we get you from document ingestion to review faster than any other platform. Uh, the Lexby discovery platform can be easily accessed by virtually any internet capable device, including PCs, Macs, iPhones, iPads, and Android devices. Although, Probably wouldn't recommend doing a large document review on an iPhone. That would be a little uh, challenging on the eyes. Uh, Lexby equips you with state-of-the-art technology that's super simple to use. So you don't have to have a dedicated IT support or litigation support professionals on staff in order to have advanced e-discovery operations. And only Lexby equips you with the Uber index. So this is a highly advanced index that is comprised of 
uh, native characters that are extracted from the documents. Uh, all the documents are uh, converted to a normalized PDF, and those are OCR. So those OCR characters uh, are, are included in that index, and then also translated characters. So having native and OCR characters is really important when dealing with large document sets because there are several use cases that really require both in order to assemble a complete data set containing the evidence and privileged documents that you need. In addition to the Uber index, Lexby also equips you with advanced technologies that are instrumental in identifying and protecting privileged documents. Lexby eDiscovery platform includes email threading, and near dupe groupings, which I find particularly powerful, especially when dialogues cross communication modalities. And it's very, very powerful in making sure that privileged documents don't slip through the cracks. And then technology assisted review for addressing those very large document sets in a timely fashion. Lexby's email thread visualization capability has great utility in that you can zoom in or out of large email threads, you can select emails and view the metadata. You can quickly identify where there are missing emails that could have been excluded from a collection or production. Lexby also equips you with the ability to quickly compare emails side by side and identify the differences via color highlighting and making sure that you're not missing privileged communications. Lexby also provides the support and professional services in the event that you need them. Uh, therefore, you don't have to have a large litigation support department or IT staff to operate eDiscovery in-house. In many cases, our team acts as an extension of yours and provides uh, staff augmentation in the event that you're dealing with a, a very large matter or a very large document set and you need assistance. Next, with Lexby, you don't have to pay an additional per gig rate for advanced analytics. You'll get near duplication, entity identification, sentiment analysis, and image recognition, all included in your Lexby subscription. Other platforms charge a hefty per gig rate for similar features like this. Lastly, I'll let you know that Lexby is the most affordable full-featured DIY e-discovery platform. We don't charge for processing. We don't charge user fees. We don't charge case fees. We don't charge a setup fee, and you can get started for as little as $5 per gig per month for a 50 gig subscription or you can start at $15 per gig per month uh, for our month-to-month -month flex plan. We recently saved a new client over $700,000 just on a single matter. Think about that when uh, you're looking at your next document intensive case um, and think about the associated costs. Is that creating friction with your clients? Is there a way to eliminate that friction and eliminate the, the hefty burden uh, that a lot of e-discovery platforms place on your particular matter. Uh, Lexby eliminates that big financial burden and uh, can save you a significant amount of money. And with that, I'll ask our last polling question, and that is, would you like a demonstration of the Lexby e-discovery platform? And while you're answering that, I'll thank you for attending today's session. We'll be making the following available to webinar attendees. You can get a recorded streaming version, an MP3 podcast, as well as a PDF of the slides. Please let us know if you have any questions or comments about this webinar or suggestions for future topics. There will be a survey at the end of the session today, and we take your input very seriously. We greatly appreciate it and value it. We wanna to continue to bring you very high quality webinars and uh, your input and feedback to us is really instrumental in that. This webinar is part of the Lexby Discovery webinar series. For notice of future live and on-demand webinars as part of this series, please email us at webinars at lexby.com or follow us on LinkedIn and we'll keep you up to date on that. And with that, I'll tell you, watch your inbox for an invite to our next webinar and best practices in e-discovery. Take care.